Hello everyone, welcome to this Green Cities webinar about how the natural environment can help combat climate change. Um, my name is Jessie Feith and I work at the Town and Country Planning Association and I'm going to be chairing today's event. We are delighted that there's so many of you on the line and we have 242 people here currently, which is great. Um, so thank you for finding the time to be here. Um, just to give a bit of background about the Green Cities project, um, this is what this webinar is being delivered through. Um, Green Cities is a pan-European campaign to promote the importance of making our urban areas greener by planting more trees and shrubs, improving parks and green spaces, and enhancing what is known as green infrastructure, um, which is the networks of green spaces, green roofs, parks and gardens that provide so many benefits to us all. Um, and in the UK, this Green Cities campaign is being delivered by the TCPA on behalf of the Green Infrastructure Partnership. Um, just to let you know um, at the start that we are recording this webinar and it will be available on the TCPA website uh, shortly after it is finished. Um, so if you want to refer back to anything, you can. Um, we will also post the speaker presentation slides um, and we will circulate a link to where you can find all of this afterwards. Um, just a bit of housekeeping. So on probably on the right hand side of your screen, there's a go to webinar control panel. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, you click on the little grey bar that says questions and type it in there. Um, you can use this at any time during the webinar, but we will save the questions for speakers until the end, um, at which point one of my colleagues will collate the questions and put them to the panel of speakers. Um, we have also included some handouts for you, which are also available in the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, these are some useful information about urban greening and climate change, and you can download them um, from that, that control panel. They will also be available on the TCPA website after the webinar finishes. Uh, we are very excited to welcome three fantastic speakers today. Anna Guggen from the United Bank of Carbon and University of Leeds, Glenn Gorner from Leeds City Council, and John Maslin from Green Space Scotland. Maslin, John is the Park Power Project Manager at Green Space Scotland. He has previously worked in the application of GIS to a wide range of socio-economic and environmental issues across the UK, and for the last 10 years has worked in the renewable energy sector in Scotland, delivering solutions based on wind, solar, and biomass technology. Very excited to hear about the Park Power Project, so over to you, John. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me clearly. Um, and good afternoon from a, uh, a very sunny East Lothian in Scotland. Um, I hope you've all got the sunshine with you. Um, this afternoon, I'm going to take you through uh, an introduction to the Park Power Programme, which some of you may have come across. Hopefully, uh, the 6% of you in, in Scotland may already know about, but uh, I know that it's received some press attention uh, over the last six months, um, south of the border as well as north. So um, hopefully uh, some of you are aware of this already. Uh, my, my role is to run this program. Um, I work uh, as an employee of, of Greenspace Scotland, which is a, uh, a small um, uh, social business, uh, social enterprise and charity based in Stirling. Um, we uh, we effectively like to be known as the, the charity for green spaces in Scotland. Uh, we work with public uh, and voluntary sector organisations, a small number of private bodies as well, uh, often on, on pioneering new uh, issues and new solutions to, uh, to green spaces, but very much uh, working across uh, amenity, biodiversity, um, health issues, and uh, in this case, energy issues, which is uh, an interesting uh, area. So uh, that's, uh, that hopefully introduces you to, uh, to us. Uh, next slide, please. So how, how do, does green space and, and energy, how do these two areas meet? What's the marriage of these two? Well, it's, it's actually very powerful. Uh, and in Scotland, um, it's, uh, it, was, it was triggered by a report that we did uh, back in 2012, which was looking at green space and the uh, mitigation and adaptation measures uh, for green spaces 
uh, to climate change uh, and how they could contribute. So there's a published report, quite a chunky report, which we did back in 2012, talking much more generally about some of the issues that my two previous speakers have spoken about. Um, and also one of the other ish areas that it raised was, uh, was the potential for green spaces to host uh, green energy uh, and act as, uh, as a sort of host for green energy, um, different types of green energy project. Uh, and this was really helped by work that we did, um, one with Ordnance Survey, looking across the whole of Great Britain uh, to produce what uh, they now refer to as their green space map. So there is a, a, a GB wide map, uh, again, I hope you've come across that uh, in, in two versions, one relatively coarse detail and one relatively fine, uh, very fine detail uh, that our, uh, maps the full green space resor uh, resource across GB. Uh, and we worked very heavily on that project to create that map. Uh, and the other bit of interesting work that happen, has happened in Scotland, at least, um, and I know there's a version in England as well, which is to map uh, demand for energy and in particular demand for heat. Uh, so there is a, also a detailed uh, publicly available map showing uh, heat demand across Scotland. Uh, and there's an extract there on the right hand side. Uh, and the interesting combination of these two is where you have green space uh, close in geographic proximity to areas of high heat demand. And that's the, the number one uh, factor, when it, particularly when it comes to low carbon heat and doing low carbon heat projects. They want to be physically close to each other because the cost of moving heat from uh, A to B uh, increases very dramatically the further you have to transport it. So uh, the ability to bring uh, and transform our, our urban centers and, uh, and our rural areas uh, is often heavily dependent on the cost factor, uh, which is um, <clears throat> uh, basically a, a function, a large function of um, the amount of pipe, uh, the length of pipe that has to be used to transport heat from where you, uh, you source it from to where the demand is. So if you really want to be locating uh, heat projects where, uh, where you have high demand. And of course, in urban areas, the challenge is that these are very congested. There's all sorts of challenges. They're often hard top or um, tarmac, uh, so it's very expensive. And um, all sorts of other high value of land. And uh, what we've been exploring is the potential to use green space in our urban centers uh, to host um, this type of uh, this type of infrastructure, much of which is often underground. So um, you'll see in future slides that uh, there are often projects that you're not uh, aware of at all. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just to give you an idea, this is this is one type of green space. This is like a a typical park uh, that we've uh, we've given you. So this is this is one. Uh, there, could, there are lots of other types of green space. Um, many, uh, large areas of amenity grassland that make up our, our urban areas and uh, that look quite different to this. They're often um, just uh, just grassed uh, and uh, surrounding um, core uh, core buildings. But uh, in this case, we're going to look at a park. What happens if uh, if you try and transform this park? Uh, typically surrounded by other public buildings like a leisure centers or schools. Uh, in this case, we've got a river that runs through the park. We've got various sports courts. Um, we've got a visitor center, uh, sports pavilion and various other buildings and a, and a, a, a lake or a lock. Uh, next slide. So what can we do with a park like this um, if we wanted to transform it uh, into a, a sort of park power park or a low carbon park? So here's, here's many of the things. Of course, you wouldn't do all of these things in one park, but just to give you an idea. So uh, we're going to uh, put an array of, uh, of boreholes uh, underneath the sports pitches. This has been done um, in a park in Edinburgh uh, to no impact on the, uh, the sports pitch. Uh, and we're collecting heat from those vertical boreholes under the, under the football pitch. And we're supplying that heat uh, to buildings outside of the park. So you'll notice that um, this, this drawing actually um, has two different models. It has what's what we call an internal or a, a sort of island model where the, uh, the energy within the park is being used to deliver 
uh, or offset energy demand from buildings and other services within the park itself. So that's, that's our internal model. There is also an external model where you're using the park either to transmit energy from uh, across the park from A to B, perhaps the points on one side of the park right away across to the other side uh, through perhaps cables or pipes. Uh, and the other external model is where we're using buildings uh, often around the edge of the park uh, and we're using the park to generate heat and then we're then transporting that heat to the buildings around the park. And it's, it's this model perhaps that's the, the most exciting and offers the biggest opportunities for us in terms of decarbonizing our whole um, energy system, which uh, uh, all UK and Scottish governments are obviously very much signed up to do. So uh, the, the example here that I've got for heat is uh, we've got little um, red lines, if you can see them in the middle, uh, that are pipes that are transporting heat underground from uh, the vertical array of boreholes to uh, public buildings, often leisure centers, uh, classic examples, leisure centers with swimming pools. They have huge heat demand. Their heating bills are often in excess of 100,000 pounds a year. Uh, and they are a massive drain on the energy uh, costs of their owners, um, which are often local authorities. Uh, so that's a classic um, and very uh, common scenario that you find. Likewise, schools um, are often co-located with parks and uh, areas of playing fields. And again, many schools are um, already looking and have looked at the idea of um, generating their energy from uh, their playing fields, uh, from using uh, heat collected from underneath playing fields uh, and other um, areas of grassland around them, or even under um, the, uh, the actual tarmac areas um, of playgrounds, which uh, of course heat up uh, much better during the summer. So uh, there are other all sorts of other um, technologies there that we could point out, batteries, EV charging, um, and solar panels um, and potentially even hydropower on the river, uh, taking heat out of the river and feeding that potentially that we could all explore um, as uh, uh, using the, the asset of the green space uh, and its uh, asset underground to generate energy that then can be fed either within the park internally or outside of the park externally. Next slide, please. But how much green space is actually out there? Well, um, of course, if we took our, uh, our OS uh, open green space data set uh, on the left hand side, this is for Aberdeen. Uh, we can calculate 8% of Aberdeen um, is covered by, by this green space. Um, uh, that might be everybody's uh, immediate idea of, uh, of the sort of level of green space coverage that our cities have. But in reality, um, somewhere between 50 and probably 65% of urban settlements, uh, right from small uh, villages up to large um, cities, uh, have a, a much greater proportion of green space. Yes, um, the diagram you're looking at does include private gardens, but uh, these are also quite important in terms of uh, their potential for energy. So it is a, a very important asset that is often uh, undervalued and uh, considered um, perhaps uh, as, uh, as something that is, is more a, a management liability, uh, unfortunately. Next slide. Thank you. Um, here's a, an example. This is the, uh, the OS uh, master map data of green space, uh, just to show you the level at which um, it's broken down to and all the different, um, what it calls primary functions um, for uh, um, breaking it into different classification. Uh, again, very detailed. Um, I won't go into any more detail now, but uh, certainly you can get hold of these slides. Next slide, please. And just uh, again, as an example, um, in Aberdeen here, this is uh, uh, there. There are multiple scenarios that are very common to all cities, not just uh, uh, cities, but also towns, where you have. Um, uh, high demand uh, buildings and the, the high demand buildings are represented by the red squares on the right hand side. So the, the maps in, in the, the two rows um, that you see on here are actually the same area. Uh, so the row one and row two um, are both two different areas, but they're the same in the row. 
Um, and the, the map on the right shows uh, uh, energy demand uh, or heat demand, should I say, um, and the red squares are buildings that have high heat demand. Uh, um, the, the point of this is just to point out how much green space there is around, uh, in the case of the top one, uh, our, our higher education centers. It could be our leisure centers, it could be our public flats, uh, publicly owned um, flats, or uh, in the bottom case there, it's, uh, it's a council HQ and uh, a local hospital uh, and some schools, uh, all of which very commonly are surrounded by quite extensive areas of green space. There is a, a good correlation, spatial correlation here between uh, green space and, and high demand, uh, what they're often termed as anchor points that um, can uh, be used to, uh, to justify uh, effective um, low carbon heat solutions. Next slide, please. A lot of councils have uh, announced that they are uh, 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 they announced a climate emergency, and um, this is uh, a couple of slides, um, a couple of points that APSI have, have made. So any authority unsure of where to start with their climate emergency would be well advised to start its actions in the area of energy, given its significance to uh, uh, to our carbon emission um, cake on the right hand side, and in particular. Um, the area of heat, which we've uh, we've been talking about, uh, and also certainly in Scotland, there is an expectation uh, from the government that the public sector um, are expected to lead the way on this. Uh, and rightly or wrongly, whether they have the resources to do that is uh, is certainly debatable uh, from many of my colleagues in the public sector. But uh, that that expectation, I, I don't know about England, but certainly in Scotland. So um, there is a. a an expectation for uh, for leadership um, from our public sector organisations, and that that's who we're talking to. Next slide, please. Uh, is it contentious to put energy into parks? Uh, well, I would I would contend it isn't. Um, many of our parks come from uh, originally came from areas that have steep sided valleys where uh, where water wheels were were uh, used for milling grain. Uh, our parks come uh, from regenerated areas of coal mining um, and our, our parks are, are used above ground now for pylons, as you can see, uh, when you get your eye in for, uh, for um, electricity substations and gas governor stations in the, the bottom right there. And of course, underground, uh, they, the ground is often already uh, used for mains electricity, gas, uh, water and sewer utility networks. So. Uh, they're already being used for this stuff. So what we're suggesting here is, is nothing really that uh, contentious, in my opinion. Next slide. Uh, lots of technologies we've explored through, uh, through our work. Uh, these are some of them. I won't dwell on them, but we've looked at uh, a wide range of different opportunities and what might work best um, on urban green space. Um, and I guess our conclusion is Yes, all of them could play some role, but uh, the, the key um, technology that we think of as the most potential is, is in the area of heat uh, and using um, the, uh, the land, uh, the green space land in our urban centers uh, to generate heat from the ground, uh, potentially from the air um, and also from um, water courses within that green space uh, and using um, heat pumps um, and uh, heat, district heat networks to transport the heat to points of, uh, of demand. Next slide, thank you. Uh, here's an example of Sockton Park in Edinburgh. Um, this, is, uh, this is a park that has got two ground source heat pumps, uh, one underneath the football pitch that you're looking at and one underneath the car park. And uh, you can see it has no real visible impact whatsoever uh, on the park, you'd never know it was there. Next slide, please. Uh, of course, this one does have a small impact, but they've uh, done their best to hide the impact uh, behind uh, some uh, a visual uh, hedge, um, both for uh, visual impact, but also for security. Um, but there is a, a ground um, mounted uh, array of, uh, of solar panels that feed its power directly to the visitor center next door. 
Next slide, please. So um, just to give you, Park Power is, a, is the program that we've been running for the last two years. Uh, it's, uh, it started um, in uh, Sockton Park, which you just saw, where uh, a project has now been delivered uh, around heat and uh, a, a mini hydro project that offsets the, the electricity demand of the, uh, of the heat pumps. So there is a, an, an active operational example now, albeit an internal model um, delivering uh, energy to the park, to the park buildings. Um, we've undertaken a, a sort of what we called an opportunity mapping exercise, strategically looking at all um, major green spaces across Scotland uh, and the opportunities that they offer. Uh, we've looked at five specific sites um, in, in the central belt of Scotland uh, in some detail, looking at the feasibility of uh, particular schemes um, for EV charging, for solar, and for heat delivery, uh, all of which um, appeared very uh, promising from our investigation so far. So we've delivered all those three. And the, uh, the last projects that we're looking at now, we're currently working with City of Edinburgh Council and Glasgow City Council, um, again, strategically looking at their green space sites uh, as to which ones offer the most promising opportunities in both of those council areas. Um, we're looking at schemes in new housing development and how you design green space and green energy projects to support um, low carbon uh, heat delivery into, into new housing. Uh, and the last project is uh, is called Green Heating, Green Spaces. Next slide, I'll tell you a bit more about that. Just finish off here. Uh, this is the one for Glasgow. So um, this is our, our dashboard, mapping dashboard for Glasgow, which anyone can access from their, their own desk uh, on the Park Power website. So um, you can go and explore anywhere in Scotland and look at the potential uh, anywhere. Um, next slide, yeah. Uh, so this is our um, Green Heat and Green Spaces project. If anyone is interested in this, please get in touch with us. Um, we put in a proposal for funding for this project and we're waiting on uh, the outcome for that. But we've got uh, a lot of uh, public sector bodies um, across Scotland uh, interested in this project as stakeholders. Uh, it's designed to um, use the OS master map data set at the most detailed level uh, to assess the potential for uh, green energy uh, in different portfolios of uh, asset portfolios that are owned by these uh, these landowning organisations, um, and it includes some at a national level like the NHS Natural National Services and uh, others at a local level. So um, it's uh, it's very much um, uh, watch this space on this one, but we'd be really keen to, in fact, be contacted by anyone who is interested in this uh, and who would like to know a bit more. So. Uh, Next slide, final one. So uh, just to summarize, uh, the, the Park Power project is, uh, is very much seeking to uh, challenge the uh, long-term view of green space as management liabilities um, and turn them into um, uh, sort of really viable assets um, that can be used in ways that uh, we think up to, up to now are largely untapped and, and haven't been uh, hugely uh, considered. Uh, the, the value of these spaces is often on, the, on a, a balance sheet is only a pound and yet um, the, uh, the, the contribution that they can make to our energy transformation uh, to decarbonize our current energy systems um, we have calculated to be very substantial uh, and uh, they, they really have a role to play. They're not by any means the only um, factor, the only contributor, but they are part of a, uh, a broader uh, set of uh, components that um, we can use to address our energy challenges. Thank you. That's me. Brilliant. Thanks, John, so much for your presentation. Um, it seems like there's an amazing range of opportunities for producing energy in parks, and I'm really looking forward to hearing more examples as this is taken up elsewhere. So thanks very much.